hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles show that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly talk show podcast in which we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Beatles, their past, the present, possibly the future. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the four regular co-hosts of the show, known for my syndicated Beatles show called Every Little Thing, being joined by my other regulars, first of all, the writer for Beatles Examiner, the number one news source for Beatles fans on the internet, that's Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. And we also have longtime writer for Beatle Fan Magazine, Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. Also a writer for Beatle Fan and for many music publications and uh, an author of several Beatle books, that being Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. On today's show, we have a very special guest with us, and that's Philip Norman. We all know Philip from having written the Beatles biography, Shout!, and uh, he's also written a biography uh, on John Lennon called John Lennon, The Life. Also, biography is on the Rolling Stones, Mick Jagger, Elton John, Buddy Holly. And um, Philip has just released a new biography on Paul McCartney, also called The Life. And we welcome Philip Norman to Things We Said Today. Hi, Philip. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, before we talk about the book on Paul... We have to note the passing of uh, Tony Barrow, who was uh, the Beatles press officer from 1962 to 1968. And as long as we have Philip on the show, Philip knew Tony. So you want to say some words about Tony and, and uh, your relationship with him? Yes. Well, um, when the Beatles first started to sort of um, be noticed in, in Britain, and we started to hear the name Brian Epstein and NEMS Enterprises... I was still on my very first newspaper, a tiny weekly newspaper in East Anglia. And I suddenly started getting in the post um, releases about the Beatles from Tony Barrow. This is a measure of how thorough he was and how he valued all of the, you know, all of the press and all of the media at that time. And I, I was thrilled to bits, absolutely thrilled to get these. I remember there was one that had cut out heads in a circle. <laughs> as if they were pupils in a school. They were the Beatles, and they were Jerry and the Pacemakers. And in the middle, there was Brian Epstein wearing a school, a scholastic um, mortarboard, as if he was the headmaster. And it just, that, that so impressed me that even I, lowly that, as I was, I was getting noticed by Tony Barra. Then when I talked my way into their dressing room on their very last UK tour of Britain, we didn't know it was their last, but it was their last, uh, I actually met him for the first time, officiating a most n nice, calm, unofficious man who, did, who didn't stop me being in the room with the Beatles because I was just again from a local newspaper. I do remember his pointed black suede shoes as well. I still <laughs> can picture them. Um, and then over the years, incredibly helpful and nice when I was doing my Beatles book and then later on doing the John Lennon book. Um, and he was just, in his own way, as unique uh, a public, you know, a publicity officer as Derek Taylor, the, the famous Derek Taylor in the later era for the Beatles. Hmm. What would you say made him so unique, apart from the fact that he recognized everybody in trying to get the Beatles publicity? Well, he had been a journalist himself, or he was a writer. I mean, he was a, um, and so had Derek Taylor, actually. So the, the, their hearts were on the side of the hacks, really even though they were working for, for the Beatles, and he would help you, you know, as far as he could, as long as you played fair with him. But he was a very, you know, sensible uh, northern chap. Um, he wasn't taken in by, you know, all of the sort of flim-flam of show business the way other PRs might have been. And uh, you always would have a, a reasonable response from Tony Barrow and a, a sensible response. Do you know how Tony handled, because, you know, you read about um, when the Beatles had uh you know certain problems like the 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 beatles being bigger than jesus controversy and uh you know how that whole thing boiled over in the united states he had to 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 work on that with with brian and with the beatles as well as the the incident in the philippines did he handle it all very calmly or was you know he did and i mean he's thought he, in that particular instance of the comment um you know which upset so many people in america which 
<laughs> it had been made in, in Britain some months before. It caused no comment at all. It was when it was picked up by an American magazine. It had such a devastating effect. And he knew, really, um, that something had to come from John. You know, an apology had to come from John. And so an apology did come from John. And John, in fact, respected Tony Barrow. Um, and in that instance, you know, he just followed the advice of Tony. Okay. Did you interview him for the McCartney book, or was that at, at this point not not necessary? No, I didn't. Um, no, I didn't. Um, oh, yes, I did. Yes, no. Uh, yeah, we had a conversation about it. Yes, because it was all about um, um, Paul uh, when he met them in a pub, first of all, and Paul was being tremendously um, socially adept and taking everybody's orders for drinks in the pub. Okay. It didn't include paying the bar bill. Okay. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. Before we talk about your book, guys, you want to say anything about Tony Barrow? No, I think so. I don't know if Philip has said uh, anything I would have said, I think. so. Mm -hmm. I, I think the one thing, though, is the, the Fab Four designation that has you know, become such a, a predominant label for them. You know, I mean, and, and he's the one that's been credited with that. I mean, I think that's... You know, that's pretty pretty interesting that he, he was the one that did that. If he said he invented it, I think we can believe him. Yeah, um, but I but yeah, I think that's I think that's pretty you know it's pretty interesting. I mean that moniker gets used has been used continually from six. You know, I remember it back in '64, and and we're you know we're still using it now. So amazing. Um, in he Holland, was. Sorry, the, the, my book is being trans or is out in Holland as well at the moment, and it was translated by four different people who called themselves the Fab Four. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe Tony should have gotten a royalty for that. Well, that's the trouble. We can't, right? copy, can't copyright <laughs> phrases. That's a pity. Exactly. Yeah. 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 He he was also the one who came up with those those fact sheets. That we saw those of us who were, you know, at least in, here in America, were kind of in on the ground floor. Uh, we saw a lot of those fact sheets in the teen mm -hmm. magazines here, you know, that Ringo didn't like Donald Duck or onions, that kind of thing. And, jo mm -hmm. uh, and John and Paul both like blondes and Bridget Bardot, that, you know, that, that sort of thing. So uh, all of that, all of that came from, from Tony Barrow. Well, he was, you know, he had one foot in the music press you know, and um, all the, the uh, weekly uh, trades in this country used to be very, obviously, very superficial. And yes, those sort of, they were called lifelines. Right. You know, poor, you know, poor likes Buddy Guy. We thought, who the hell's Buddy Guy? You know, <laughs> seemed very, very clever at the time. It, it, it kind of predates the, uh, the whole list thing today, you know, where, you know, a mm. lot of websites do lists. You know, that's kind of the same on the same idea, if you think about it. So, Good idea. I think there's just one thing that, um, you know, it's in a, a section of Philip's book where he's talking about Paul and John sniping at each other in Melody Maker. And this phrase didn't get into the book, but I was looking at the articles uh, this morning when uh, uh, Paul did an interview in Melody Maker and is critical of John because of, you know, how do you sleep? And John wrote back and in responding to Paul's comments about the hype around Let It Be, John says, well, you have to admit it, it really was a new phase Beatles album, wasn't it? And the phrasing was like the, almost like the style of the great Barrow himself. So John is looking back at Tony Barrow as a, you know, someone who would come up with these kind of phrases. And those, it shows how papers like The Melody Maker was still so important to John. You know, and, um, mm -hmm. he, even, he used to, the, the best letter of the week used to get an album as a prize. And John would write at the bottom of his own letters, album winner. <laughs> well, also where Tony Barrow is concerned, he also wrote the liner notes on the back of Beatle albums, the first few. Right, yeah. And right. Um, I think one thing we should be eternally grateful to Tony Barrow for is that it was his idea that the Beatles do the, their own Christmas messages. And, uh, you know, how much we cherish those every single year when we listen to them. Yes, it gets more right. and more sort of amazing how sarcastic John is being. Nobody noticed at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so let's talk about the new book. Again, it's called Paul McCartney, The Life. And so I just want to start by asking you the question, why is it 
all these years it took you this long to write a book on Paul and there may be some people who might think that this is a response to some of the negative uh, criticism uh, you might have gotten when Shao came out that it was a bit biased towards John you know, I mean, yes. I know Paul. Paul, in fact, referred to the book uh, to a certain word that sounds like shout. So, was this kind of a, uh, your own way of maybe making up to Paul? Well, there is an element of that in it because I I was not fair to uh, Paul in, in shout, um, and I admit that. And by the time I came to write the uh, biography of John Lennon, I, I had realized that I hadn't been fair to him, um, and in fact. He had phoned me um, after Shout came out, unexpectedly, Paul had, um, after I had talked to Yoko in the Dakota building, only five months after John's death, actually. And she had made some comment about John having said Paul hurt him more than anybody else had ever hurt him. And Paul saw this in the Sunday Times and phoned up and I was out. So my girlfriend took the call. But I didn't try to get back to him because I thought that's the finish. I'm not going to write another Beatles bi biography. That's it. I've done it. But of course, I hadn't done it. You never get away once you've done it. Uh, <laughs> um, it's like more Michael Corleone, you know. I think <laughs> uh, but then when I set about the, the John Lennon book, which I thought because I had Yoko's cooperation, that would not uh, allow me to have anything to do with Paul's cooperation because I thought if I have one I just don't have the other the Beatles politics are like that but again he phoned me I sent a message via his PR and he actually phoned me and I talked to him for about half an hour and uh, he said I'm phoning just to see what this bloke's like you know that, that hates me so, so much I said I don't hate you at all it's not true and we had a very nice conversation because I was not a writer trying to get quotes out of him. I was just talking to him like another bloke. And he helped me on the John Lennon book by email. He answered some cru crucial questions of fact by email very generously. Um, but again, I didn't think of doing a book on him. But then I realized that there should be a companion volume to the Lennon, uh, to the Lennon one. And I contacted him. And within literally a couple of weeks, I got a four-line email from McCartney saying, I'm happy to give you tacit approval. So that tacit approval meant that I could talk to people very close to him, like his brother-in-law, John Eastman, who had never talked about Eastman's involvement in the, you know, the final days of the Beatles and people like Peter Asher. He has a stepmother, of course, and a stepsister, and I could talk to them. So in the end, he sort of accepted that I, it, it, there is a sort of element of, of contrition, if not apology, in this book. Mm. I certainly sense that. <laughs> We do this like a round table, so each of the guys will ask you a question. Why don't we start with Al? Well, uh, matter of fact, I, I did want to ask about a couple of the uh, the people who are obviously major players in this book, and one of whom is Jim McCartney, who I think a lot of us knew somewhat about, but is uh, I think uh, you this you know took to liking him a great deal as a um, as a as a character because obviously you didn't you didn't know him but as a character in the book say so to speak what was your impression of Jim McCartney? Well, any understanding of Paul McCartney has to come from understanding Jim McCartney, his father, who never earned more than about ten pounds a week uh, in the Liverpool cotton industry when Liverpool still had a cotton industry. And yet, um, especially after the death of Paul, Paul and his brother Michael's mother, um, when Paul was 14, managed to create this happy and stable home for the two boys, uh, helped by a large extended family. And he instilled into both of them, and particularly into Paul, you know, the very best of values, which are still there, despite all of the wealth and all of the adulation that Paul has received. He is fundamentally a, a decent, decent human being. He may have his moments of egomania, whatever it may be, you know, petulance, whatever. But he is still his father's son. And uh, luckily, I was able to talk to Jim McCartney's second wife, Angie. He didn't get married. He didn't seemed to look at another woman after the loss of Paul's mother, Mary, until Jim was into his 60s. He suddenly met a much younger, very vivacious woman, Angie, and he adopted her daughter, Ruth. 
So Paul acquired a stepmother and a stepsister. And he was exactly the same, obviously exactly the same with his little daughter, stepdaughter, Ruth, and with Angie, as he had been with Paul and Michael, these little sayings, his funny little sort of Liverpool proverbs and things he would say, um, the way he attached great importance to regular bowels, um, the way he, he got lavender from the garden and made the house smell of lavender. And he just obviously was a lovely man. And of course, as you know, he was the only real music teacher that Paul ever had. Jim had had a little local amateur jazz band in the 1920s and 1930s in Liverpool. He loved uh, Hollywood show tunes. He loved uh, northern brass band music. And that all, he passed all of that on to Paul. And so you see the influences in Sgt. Pepper and, you know, all the, the, the very much the mainstream part of Paul's music um, is thanks to his father. So his father was hugely important. Alan? Okay. Shall I ask a, 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 a sort of critical question? <laughs> Whatever you like. Okay. You know, there's been an awful lot of research on the Beatles since Shout, and um, a number of things, um, a number of the standard stories have changed. And, uh, for instance, the one about um, Ringo turning up and George Martin not knowing he was coming. I mean, the chronology isn't isn't quite that way. I mean, Ringo turned up the session before he hired Andy White. And also the whole business of how EMI signed the Beatles in the first place. It was basically forced on George Martin. Um, and I'm, I'm just sort of wondering whether... You know, pr presumably you've you've run into this research, seeing as you know this is what you do. Um, I, I'm wondering if you didn't take those things into account because your sources lead you to believe that the standard stories are somehow more accurate. Well, I didn't set out to to plod through the whole story of the Beatles all over again in this book. Obviously, it is a hugely important part, and perhaps to many people still the most interesting part. But I felt that the years since the Beatles for McCartney, which had been virtually ignored, actually, um, by any sort of so-called serious biographers, um, really needed, needed attention. And uh, so, you know, and that, that period is longer than John Lennon's lifetime since the Beatles broke up. So what I did, as you, can, as, you, as you all have read in the book, is to keep Paul center stage all the time. There are many things like the, um, uh, as you say, the chronology of Ringo at the first recording sessions or um, Shea Stadium or something like that. People will know what I'm talking about when I say Shea Stadium or the MBE. So I didn't plod through the whole story all over again. I felt it was more important to have McCartney center stage and reacting to the events as they happened. Mm, okay. Did you actually come to like him more as you researched the book than say, uh, obviously, maybe you like him more than during the time you wrote Shout, but, but as you finished the book, did you come to sort of have some sort of sympathy for him? Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, because what I discovered was this um, person who has been blessed with all these amazing gifts by heaven, um, not only huge talent, but enormous charm amazing good looks you th you would think someone like that would be the most complacent human being there ever was he's not he w and he never was in his own sort of way he was as insecure as john lennon was john as we know uh, his insecurity came from what he thought was a you know a fractured and unwanted sort of being an unwanted child although he wasn't really lots of his family actually wanted were competing to to, to take care of him with poor paul paul had a happy and stable family life he has this amazing talent which like all amazing talent does not allow the, the possessor of the talent ever to feel secure hmm. he's always there is never any self-satisfaction really with him and so that's why to this day he is still on most nights of the year doing three hours on stage without an intermission or a sip of water because right. he, he can never he can never feel sort of that he's done what he wanted to do despite all of what he's achieved and all the rewards that he's. Mm -hmm. um, you had said just a second ago that um, some people find the the Beatles segment of his career more interesting. Still, uh, I'm just wondering, what about you? I mean, if if you look at the totality of his music, which you would have sort of been through during the writing of this book, um, 
do you feel that his uh, solo career does measure up to those 10 years with the Beatles, 10, 12 years? It can't measure up because the world was different. He was different. He was older. You know, um, th- th- their achievement, Lennon and McCartney, is amazing to realize is when they're in their very, very early 20s. It's, and it's just amazing what they achieved. Later on, the world was harder and more cynical. But McCartney didn't stop being a wonderful songwriter mm-hmm. at the end of the Beatles. He just didn't, that sort of talent just didn't switch off. But it becomes harder to find the the really exceptional songs because he was, you know, in a wanting a commercial, successful band in the seventies that first rode on the glam rock thing and later on on sort of stadium rock as it evolved. But you can find McCartney songs like that song "Dear Friend," which is as sweet and you know lovely and inspired as anything he ever wrote, which was hardly even noticed when it came out on the Ram album. Mm-hmm. John, obvi- John obviously never knew it existed. Otherwise, John wouldn't have been slinging mud at Paul in "How Do You Sleep." So there was, st- and the the song "Water uh, Waterfalls" later on, which has a kind of awful prophecy of losing Linda to me, because his voice has so much more pathos than it ever had before, or ever would again. So there are those examples, but of course, you know, his, what he wanted to do was to have a num- numerically, statistically successful band to rank with the Beatles in the 70s, and that's what he achieved. Mm-hmm. So then, apart from the Beatles, uh, looking at his solo career, what would you rate as his best work? Well, those songs, I think, um, more infrequent. He always, I think he's just the same as John, each of them was always looking over his shoulder at the other and what the other was doing, even though they professed to be completely, become independent from each other. But I think that as a sort of commercial album, uh, which was the one that finally got him the, you know, uh, critical and popular acclaim, Band on the Run, it's a very good, it's a great commercial album. Um, But I think think they're more sort of scattered among a huge output, you know, from this band whose personnel was continually changing. Mm. Okay. Okay, Steve. Thank you for doing this, Philip. Um, uh, uh, It's great to be able to talk to you. Let me ask you... um, well, there's two things. Uh, two things I'm gonna I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start with um, the loves, the real loves of Paul's life, and I'm gonna uh, start with Jane Asher. I mean, every uh, it seems like you know every time the discussion about Jane Asher comes up, everybody kind of there's always kind of a wishing that he had he had stuck with Jane Asher. Although everybody loves Linda now, and 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 of course, uh, and Nancy gets a lot of you know, is uh, is much loved also. But what happened? What what do you think happened with with Paul and Jane Asher? Why why didn't that work? I think well, they were still young, both of them. She had a very good career, which was actually improving all the time. And I think that was a bit of difficulty. I think there was enough of the old sort of North, North Country chauvinist in him to sort of rather, you know, wish she would concentrate all her attention on him. He also had an amazing sort of choice of virtually all the young women in the world were at his disposal if right. he wanted. Um, and he made full use of that prerogative, there's no doubt. Um, whereas if you think about all the years he was married to Linda, there is not one breath of alleged infidelity in that whole time that is really amazing in that sort of world you know admittedly she was on most of the tours um that wouldn't necessarily have stopped it mm-hmm. yeah um how about uh how about nancy was that um i mean nancy kind of as i recall came up from kind of nowhere and the romance really blossomed and look i mean it, it appears from all indications that they're getting along great does that what do you think happened with Nancy? Uh, did he just find somebody in, in, in after Linda's death? Did he just find somebody that he needed to have? Or Well, we as we know, um, he made a, quite a hasty marriage, which didn't last all that long and cost him quite dear. Uh, and what he told um, a very famous producer in the West End here that he... Uh, he wanted really, uh, as his as he got older, was someone to be waiting in the wings every night when he came off stage to say, "You were wonderful, darling." Now, there's an indication of someone who is not smug at all, really. And in fact, Tony Brownwell 
uh, whose name I'm sure you all know, um, <laughs> said that uh, you know um, Linda was Linda was Jewish actually technically, and she was from New York, and uh, Nancy is a Jewish woman from New York who has also got lots of money of her own. Um, and all these sort of these all tick sort of very you know firmly tick boxes obviously with Paul, and she just seems a thoroughly nice woman. Her, her, her um, his children all seem to love her, particularly his son who's had problems. James has had problems, you know, particularly with Heather, um, and she has just obviously completely embraced this you know, quite un, unhappy and insecure young man in a, in a rather wonderful way. Yeah, uh, it, it's it's really interesting. Getting back to what you said about his insecurity and touring and continuing to tour, that kind of kind of interweaves in there, doesn't it, with the romance thing? Um, you know that he needs somebody uh, that he found somebody so quickly, like Nancy, and 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 he's uh, he's done so well. Um, there, I mean, you're right. I mean, he has he was he has a history. If you especially if you go way way back of you know, having a, a lot of women, as you say, he could have had anybody. And uh, it's it's interesting that he, you know, that he's locked into uh, three, you know, he locked into two marriages that really were good for him, that he really, you know, that really worked for him. So, well, you know, that, um, you know when uh, uh, Linda first appeared on the scene, she was getting just almost as much sort of horrible comment in the press and from the fans as Yoko, who they, they were more or less around the same time. And um, no one could imagine that Paul, who had his pick of all these gorgeous young 60s, they used to call them dolly birds, um, and yet he went for someone who w was, looked like she brushed her hair very often, you know. But Linda actually answered a need in him that um, nobody imagined could be there, which was that he wanted a, a, a home and a family. And that was she had her own insecurities as well, and her, you know she lost her her own mother when she was very young, and that was what worked. He she, she made this wonderful home environment, particularly out of the farm in Scotland that he bought while he was with Jane, but he'd never really sort of done much to it, and suddenly you know they were they were making that their permanent base for a lot of the time. Okay, let me get a little ahead. Are you thinking about doing biographies of George Harrison or Ringo? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. They're not going to pull me back in again. Um, <laughs> they're not going to pull me back in again. I was thinking the other night that, that it, perhaps it, you know, if it were a book about the two of them as the second division, you know, the other ranks. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But I still, I mean, I know that you know, there's a George has a huge following and is is esteemed very greatly. I've never felt that he was remotely on the level of Lennon and McCartney. I think that um, what happened was that some of their magic rubbed off on him eventually, um, but it didn't really last once he was any distance away from them. Um, and I think it would be quite uh, toilsome to write about his, you know, his uh, religious uh, parallel career and all of that. Um, though I, I know it was absolutely sincere and probably, you know, saved his sanity in lots of ways because they all, you know, had a t something we could never imagine about the Beatles, that they could be under horrible pressure and be suffering. But of course they were for a lot of the time mm -hmm. because of the completely unreal life they had to lead. Right. Getting back to McCartney, one last question. Um, what do you think of the, there's been a lot of comment online about the uh, upcoming release of Pure McCartney, and some people are have been re really critical. I think we've just talked about it ourselves. What do you think that indicates? Uh, uh, how, do, how do you see that that release as, you know, in the scope of, of his career and, and why he's putting it out at this particular time? I mean, I can only say that he is never going to stop, you know, while he has breath. He's never going to stop putting out albums. And uh, we've seen in the last what, 15, 10, 15 years that they can, they can contain some very, very good things. They're not just someone trading on his, you know, the huge sort of nostalgia or the huge affection that the human race cherishes towards him. You know, he's still finding new, new things to say and new things to play. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you, Philip. Go ahead, Ken. I want to bounce off something that, that you just said before, Philip, and also, um, Steve, you were talking about it, too. This constant touring from Paul and this need to keep working, keep doing what he normally does to satisfy his fans, and, and I'm sure to satisfy his own 
you know, artistic process and everything that he does. Do you think that after all these years and after everything that he's accomplished, and he's, he still is the most successful songwriter of all time, do you think that he's unfulfilled in his mind? I just think that this kind of adulation, I've seen it with others too, you see it with Mick Jagger and you see it with Elton John, it doesn't, as I say in my book, it's a bit like Chinese food. Um, an hour after you receive it, you uh, want some more. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and I think that that's what it is. You know, he, he needs to have this reaffirmed, really, the, the love of the audience, the fact that he can cast such magic over the audience um he needs to keep on proving it now this man is getting into his 70s um it's amazing that he is this is a uh, someone playing music that you once weren't supposed to be able to play after the age of 30 mm -hmm. right. and uh right and yet he's up but he's also push i mean he's not only as a huge part of his stage performance made up of beatles songs very often songs that were identified with john once upon a time um, but he also goes really sort of deeply into into his own sort of back catalogue of tracks like Temporary Secretary, which was weird when it came out and still is weird, actually. <laughs> and he, he's, but he still plays them. And uh, he says it's so funny that, you know, from the audience, um, whenever, whenever he's playing a Beatles song, there's millions of little phone lights as he's being photographed. But as soon as he does Temporary Secretary, the arena goes black. <laughs> <laughs> interesting well i find it a very interesting song myself but um <laughs> i would like to uh, uh bring up one thing here specifically about uh something that you wrote about the lennon mccartney songwriting credit and i'm going to quote you here this is in page 182 it says by paul's account the decision was taken by brian and john this is for it to be in that order lennon mccartney and when he, when Paul protested, not very strongly, they told him it wasn't set in stone, but could be alternated in the future. It was always my impression that, that John and Paul decided this together, that it would be Lennon McCartney, probably because it flowed better, I think. But um, it was only later on when it started to bother him, when there were songs like Yesterday, which John had nothing to do with, why couldn't they be McCartney-Lennon? So I think it's only like... You notice um, with Wings Over America when that came out that those those Beatles songs he, he, that were Paul songs came out as McCartney Lennon, and um, you know it, what was it really decided by John and Brian as uh, well? This well, that's I what, guess you're saying that's what Paul said. That's what Paul says, and uh, as you know, some of the very early examples of the credit it was McCartney Lennon, and then suddenly it became Lennon McCartney, which is follows the sort of alphabetical sort of convention anyway of songwriters, um, songwriting credits. And um, but it, I think this should give us all some comfort that you know how even if you're as famous and as wealthy and as adulated as Paul McCartney, things can still niggle at you inside, little things. And um, that did with him for a long, long time. And, and he says it doesn't, or he rather he's, he lives with it now because he doesn't want to seem to be sniping at John. But I, I still don't think he likes the idea, particularly as, you know, s s s he looked on his iPad or he looked on his phone at the, at the credit once and it, and for yesterday, and it said John Lennon and blank as the songwriting credit. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, it, you know, he's, he's obviously seeing it all the time, and every time he sees the credit, of course, it reminds him. And actually on the, the Please Please Me album, the Lennon-McCartney songs were listed first as McCartney-Lennon, but that was supposed to be a mistake that George Martin made. At least that's what I think uh, Mark Lewison had said. Well, uh, all I can say is that Paul himself says that it was decided by Brian and John to make it Lennon-McCartney. How it got him... To McCartney and Lennon in the first place, I, I can't imagine. Okay. Um, what would you say, if you could pick one or two of them, were the, the biggest revelations in your book on Paul? I think it's the character of Paul McCartney is the biggest revelation because the, the world has such a fixed idea of him and it's completely wrong. And there is this insecurity and there is also um, the, the charm and the niceness, which is so unusual always was so unusual and still is in you know the field of rock or pop stardom 
is to a large degree genuine. Um, you know, he really was like that, and where it came from was his father and his family. But actually, all through the book, there is a, an awful lot of new material. The problem I find is that um, I'm not talking about obviously present company in any way, but a lot of people who write reviews of new books on the Beatles or Beatle related subjects who, who call themselves experts absolutely hate being told anything about the subject that they didn't know already. They absolutely hate it. And they try to, it's rather like um, in the Arabian Nights when the bride accidentally farts in the bridal chamber and all the serving <laughs> women sort of rattle their jewelry to try and cover up the embarrassment. And so all these so-called experts sort of frantically rattle their jewelry to hide the fact they've just read something they didn't know already. Um, there's a lot of examples of in this book about Jim McCartney, um, about, you know, the girlfriend that Paul had, Iris Caldwell, who was Rory Storm's sister, Rory Storm of the Hurricanes fame sister, um, who was a trapeze artist, then became a can-can dancer, and um, how her mother used to, Paul used to like to relax by having uh, Iris's mother comb the hair on his legs. No, you won't find that in any other book. Uh, everything that John Eastman, virtually every word that John Eastman said about the era with Alan Klein and then the litigation after that uh, is not in any other book before. The fact that Paul and John Eastman and Linda felt they really were on their own against the combined weight of Alan Klein, all his lawyers, the Apple lawyers, John, Paul and Ringo, all ganging up against Paul. And... Paul was even running out of money. He was having to live on Linda's money. None of that has ever been in the book before. And that goes right through, really. Um, his, his, his extraordinary, this secret girlfriend he had in the 60s, who was Marianne Faithful's nanny, originally children's nanny, Maggie McGiven, had never spoken to anyone at all um, about the sort of parallel affair that went on with while he was with Jane Asher, um, and how they used to meet at the only safe place he thought they could meet where no one would notice was at antique auction sales in Chelsea. They both had to go along and pretend to be bidding for bits of furniture, you know, so they could meet. When I was writing those and the other one passages I've talked about, I really sort of thought, my God, I really have never heard this before. And that was really some excitement to, to compensate for the terrible hard work of writing a book like this, which it obviously is. Mm. Mm. All right, before I pass you over to Al, I just have one really important question here, and that is, because you were just touching uh, upon this here, is the the image that Paul projects of himself publicly really, is it genuine? Is, is that the real guy that we see? Because there are some people who think of Paul with that thumbs up, positive, it's like that Dana Carvey impersonation, which I think is very exaggerated. But um, he, he's always very positive. He hardly ever has anything bad to say about anybody, and that's probably the PR side of him. But is he really this the, the image that he projects? I mean, I do believe in all my heart that everything that he does with his career is something that he loves doing. He loves recording. He loves performing. And he is very much the family man, especially that um, that that he has portrayed himself to be. He's always been so supportive of all the members of his family every activity that they're involved with he sh you know he shows up occasionally and you know this is all part of who paul mccartney is but is that really is is that all there is to paul or is there you know another side that we really don't know i think there you know we all have a dark side of course we do um but you the very key word that you mention is positive if you think of the best mccartney tracks good day sunshine you know they, they just give you such a lift. They are so buoyant. I mean, he could sing, a, he could, he and John could sing a song that goes, I'm a loser, and make it sound happy. <laughs> I'm down. I'm down. That's a happy song. That is amazing. You know, when they went on the, the dreadful tour of Scotland, backing Johnny Gentle, Paul was the one who was out there shaking hands, sending postcards to his father saying, I've been signing autographs, you know, playing the role of Paul Ramone, as indeed he did. But the great example of that is when this incident, when as a result of which he was um, in, in, in jail in Tokyo in 1980. Now, 
you know, all the, the accounts of that you will read say that he was just held in a police station, you know, and it somehow wasn't quite as bad as it need, needed to have been. For some reason, he was transferred from the police's custody to the Ministry of Justice after about three days. And he was incarcerated in a really terrible old prison with uh, convicted killers, the mafiosi, and not treated any differently from the other prisoners. And he managed to almost enjoy it. Wow. <laughs> almost like a, a kind of rather severe health spa. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Because for those few days, he didn't have to be Paul McCartney. He was prisoner number 22. He was one of the lads. They all got two cigarettes a day. They could smoke. They had to smoke it around a, a, a tin that they then flick, flick their ash into the tin. And he sort of, he just made the most of it. And that is amazing to me. That sort of positive outlook, which is, if you think about it, the, be, the best part of McCartney music, very, very seldom is there a sort of downer in a song by him. That is really the core of the man. It's being positive and exuberant. Now, the, the thumbs up and all the rest of it did get a bit too much, but still, <laughs> that is very like, that is very, very like the real McCartney. And for that sort of person to, not only to exist in pop music, but to survive, to go on being that way is a little miracle. The drink it all in thing he does every night, you know, where he, he tells the crowd, uh, I want to drink it in. It, mm. That kind of kind of uh, goes to that, too. Uh, but, yeah, you, you, that's a that's a great point. OK, thank you, Philip. Al? Uh, bouncing off something that you had said a few minutes ago about uh, uh, the, the kind of people who would be who would be reading a book like this. What is basically your target audience for this book or is there a target audience for this book? Yes, absolutely. My target audience is someone who may not be, if such people do exist, and perhaps they still do, is people who aren't necessarily interested in the Beatles or in, interested in McCartney, but someone who will read this book as a book, as a piece of writing, as an extraordinary epic story, uh, which takes in the history of the last half century, or half of the previous century and a bit of this century, because I try to write a book that is just a a book that is um, a, a real biography, a real piece of literature, if I can aspire to that, which explains why this happened and the times in which it was happening. So I try to give the social background to what was happening in the world at the same time as what was happening to these very young men and the extraordinary events that they somehow or other precipitated. I ask this because of the fact that in the book, especially in the the section where you go really beyond the Beatles and into his post-Beatles career, the music is almost secondary to the you know to the the story of Paul himself, as as you mentioned earlier, that you've sort of put him in there as the central focus, which obviously it's a biography, but the music does seem to be kind of sublimated. Whereas for instance, in, you know, toward the end of the book, there are pages and pages and pages and pages about the divorce proceedings between him and Heather. And I'm not sure whether that particular saga really rates the amount of, uh, the amount of mileage, if you will, that there is in, you know, in this book. So it's... Well, that is a valid comment, of course, um, if you think that. I, I think to go through every single McCartney album, you would need a very big book. Um, and you might exhaust the patience of, you know, even very devout admirers of his music. Um, I felt that this... Uh, uh, this episode with Heather McCartney, Heather Mills McCartney, deserved great detail. Firstly, because it was the point where the world, which had kind of regarded Paul McCartney as one of the most envy envied beings on earth, suddenly it, it felt good not to be Paul McCartney. He was going through this awful, you know, first of all, the separate, the marriage, then the separation, then the divorce. <laughs> The worst year of all being when he was 64, 
Um, yeah. Now, if you remember the idyllic picture he painted as a as a young boy of what he'd be like in, when he was sixty four, and what the reality, you know, that the, the irony was Greek in its scale and awfulness. So yes, and and also the fact, you know, that what it revealed about the life that he led and and his amazing, and not only um, you know the horrors, but the way that he absolutely involved himself in Heather's sort of interests in the same way he had with Linda, you know, vegetarianism with Linda and animals and animal rights. With Heather, it was, you know, the landmines campaign, all of that. He had this, what, you know, great Scott Fitzgerald phrase, willingness of the heart to get involved with what Heather was interested in. And also the amazing gener financial generosity, the amounts of money that were paid over um, in those years. So I, d I couldn't ignore that. I couldn't just skate over that. I, I see. Although, uh, again, uh, an awful lot of space is devoted to her brief. And, you know, let's face it, in the opinion of a, a goodly number of people, if she said today is Monday, they wouldn't believe it. Uh, <laughs> so, so one wonders how worthwhile it was to to put out that amount of material that you know a good amount of which is probably fiction but there's an awful lot of you know hard documentary evidence um fr from that era of um you know her on the larry king show um her on television um it's not just uh, I, I agree uh, her account itself might be fallible but in fact, I, 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 for that reason, I didn't seek to interview her, although she has since contacted me. <laughs> she has since, te since texted me and told me some other things, which I'm still digesting. I can only imagine. <laughs> oh, I'd love to. Oh, can, can you reveal some of that, Philip? <laughs> uh, I can't really. I can't, no. But um, oh, it, her thesis her thesis, which she still sticks to, is that you know she was equally important. She was equally a celebrity with McCartney, and um, um, and that she did. She really did. Sort of. She she was the one who got got him back performing after you know after the tragedy of Linda's death. But there again, you know, other people will say, well, you know, as people have sort of said over the past few years, um, you know, why bother about wings they were in the end they probably weren't as a unit you know one of the great sort of original rock bands of all time because that's not what they were meant to be they were they were really a frame for paul mccartney but still i found i thought that the wings the wings story was so interesting the, the, the terribly unstable lineup for, for a start and the number of people who came and went in that band was quite extraordinary and uh, and the sort of the internal dynamic of the, of the band was very, very so I devoted a lot of space to wings as you can see mm. some people might not care for yes can I can I can I ask something about about the we've all known that Paul has had a history with avant-garde music and how, how where does that stand as far as you're concerned in in his life yes he he firstly he always had a passionate interest when he was you know he won a uh, he won a competition for writing an essay about the Queen Queen Elizabeth II's coronation in 1953 when he was 11 years old. And with his, um, he got a book token or something and he bought a book on modern art. That's how interested he was, how early his interest in contemporary art was. But of course, another of his uh, grievances, which doesn't seem to go away, was that John was always cast as the avant-garde experimental <laughs> Beatle and Paul as the tuneful, the safe, you know, the melodious Beatle. The fact was that he was living in central London, he was living in the attic of Jane Ash's parents' house in Wimpole Street, which is mostly an enclave of sort of high-priced um, private clinics and doctors and dentists, living on the top floor in a kind of very chaste, sort of almost a Peter Pan sort of world with Jane mm. on the floor below and no no creeping about after, after lights out at all. And uh, 
but Jane's brother was, you know, Peter Asher, um, start, helped to start the Indica Gallery, which was the most avant-garde art gallery in London and bookshop with Barry Miles as well. Paul was very involved in that. He was also someone who wanted, was, who really wanted to learn about art and to get into all of these different sort of fields of, you know, music, concrete, Luciano, Berio, people like that, Takis, the sculptor. And then, of course, René Magritte as well. He fell in love with René Magritte through Robert Fraser, the art dealer. Um, he was absolutely up to his neck on the avant-garde when, as he himself put it, John was living on a bloody golf course in Weybridge, you know, which is deep in the stockbroker belt. And he was the one who was tipping John off about these things and encouraging him to read and to come up to London and see these exhibitions. And so it does, you know, still obviously rankle with him that he has been miscast in this way by posterity. Thank you. Alan? Pleasure. Yeah, I think it's um, it's sort of his his avant garde thing is kind of interesting because while I, I believe that he really was the one who had those interests early and that, uh, you know, when tomorrow never knows those were actually his tape loops. It wasn't just that he got John interested in tape loops. He, he brought those tape loops in. And yet when he began writing classical music, he wrote really very late 19th, early 20th century classical music that didn't take into account the classical avant-garde at all. It, it's just kind of odd. What do you make of that? I just think um, you know, he wanted to he wanted to be in the world of you know classical classical music and um, that was what he was aiming for. But and of course the other thing is that he, he would he he was happy for those uh, elements to be on Beatles albums on Beatles um, singles and tracks, um, but within reason. <laughs> and of course then John went all over the place and. Uh, um, revolution number nine and all of that so um you know for paul it was sort of he was putting he was only really doing it to put tasters on the beatles music but john wanted it to be you know dominant mm -hmm. um there was one uh episode in the book that i, I was just sort of wondering what your your take on was I mean, you you explain it a little but you know right after you right after jim dies or while jim is in his last illness and you describe him as uh, paul is saying to angie you'll never want for anything and then pretty much immediately after jim died uh he sort of cut her off um what do you make of that i mean it, it seems it seems like going off to spain on a vacation after someone dies, after, you know, caring for them all, all that time, as, as you point out, seems a little extreme as a reason. Uh, there were a couple of other things. Um, <laughs> um, there, was a, there was something about um, his birth certificate having been sold. Um, in fact, uh, she said it was a, a certified copy. It wasn't a real birth certificate um, mm -hmm. because she, she was short of money. I mean, after, in, in immediately after Jim's death. But it, it does seem strange, yes, and I can't really explain it. I, I think that uh, family politics had a lot to do with it, perhaps more than even Angie sort of says, because it's still a very painful subject for her, though she's, you know, she's a very feisty woman now who has a life in America and markets Mrs. McCartney's herbal teas and that sort of thing. And I believe mm -hmm. she even, even has a doctorate some, from somewhere. But... It's just you know that there were a lot was a large family circle who perhaps did not um, weren't so happy about her having married Jim possibly I can't speculate. Mm. Have you had any reaction directly or indirectly from Paul since the book's been out? No, I haven't. I I, I mean I'm hoping I'll get one. Obviously, and I think I sh ought to get one since you know it was done with his tacit approval. It actually you know Eve there is even you know. Um, MPL copyright material in the book, fully acknowledged, but I, I haven't done so far. And in fact, I offered him the chance to read the uh, text. Um, perhaps I should. I, I offered Yoko the same. And look what happened there. <laughs> but uh -huh. but he sent me back a actually a very nice email saying, "I find it hard to um, decide what I think of me um, without really sort of finding out what you think of me." But I'd sent him a letter saying the line I was taking, which was that I was dwelling a lot about his father, um, his father's influence, and also about his marriage to Linda. And he just said, your letter was reassuring, so go ahead, really. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're winding down on our hour, so I should pass you back to Ken. Oh, I just had a couple of comments based on what you recently said um, about the avant-garde thing, that it bothers Paul that John is perceived more as the avant-garde guy in the Beatles. I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that not only were certain Beatles songs, at least now they're considered mm, perhaps the most adventurous of the Beatles, A Day in the Life, I Am the Walrus, those songs, and Tomorrow Never Knows, despite Paul's involvement with the song. Um, the fact that, you know, John also was with Yoko, an avant-garde artist, and it was John and Yoko's idea to do Revolution Number no. Nine, uh, sure. you know. And while while Paul did Carnival of Light, <laughs> that never came out. So it's all you know perception based on the fact that this is what was released, you know. And exactly. Paul Paul was very much into the avant garde. He just didn't he didn't show it as much in the music that he released. But if you think about it, I mean, just stepping back a cup, you know, a little bit, um, a song like Eleanor Rigby, um, how revolutionary was that? Right. You know, it was, you know, um, Penny Lane, you know, um, George Melly said, you, you, you can, you get a picture of Liverpool in the 1950s from that song. If you, if you never saw Liverpool in the 1950s, you can see the sandstone churches and you can see the green trams, you know, streetcars. Um that was revolutionary in its own way. It was just pushing the bounds of what was possible. And that goes right back to the beginning when they were still, Lennon McCartney was still skewing their songs to what they thought pop songs were like. Little bits of vernacular were creeping in from Paul that had never been in there before, in a pop song before. Um, sometimes when we're dreaming deep in love, not a lot to say, not a lot. I and mean, it's so British understatement, not a lot means nothing. <laughs> Um, for that to sort of turn up at that early stage in a pop lyric by Paul is, I think, is extraordinary. Right. Oh, I totally agree with you. I think when, when songs like Yesterday and Eleanor Rigby first came out in Penny Lane, people were just amazed at, at, at the arrangement and using classical elements and all that. I don't know if today people look at it the same way. I think a lot of people look at the weirder stuff, you know, yes, like but, I Am the Walrus, but, and, and, and admire that maybe perhaps a bit more unfairly. Yes, because that it does still sound very, very adventurous. Yes, it does. And, I oh, have to, it and so does A Day in the Life. But the funny thing at the time was that nobody kind of said, my God, this is extraordinary they're doing this. People just accepted. This is the Beatles. They accepted that every album was a huge step forward and they were pushing this or that boundary that had never been pushed before um it, it was extraordinary that you know the expectation at the time was absolutely boundless of what they were going to do and so no one ever sort of said oh my god no one's ever written a story about a poor woman sweeping up wedding rice in a church you know they just accepted it mm, okay and the other thing i do want to respectfully disagree with you on Philip, is the what you said about Wings being uh, more or less um, recordings for? It was like Paul's um, framework, I think. That what was the the phrasing you used? Um, because I do think that that I think Paul really tried. Paul really tried to establish Wings as a group because if you look at the middle period of Wings, you do have a lot of songs from Denny Lane, and even during the Wings Over America tour, Denny sang lead on five songs, so it wasn't just all Paul. And even if you go to like a Wings at the Speed of Sound album, every member gets a lead vocal. So that was something that was very consciously done. So I think he might well, you know, I think he liked the idea of a, a band. Yes, being in a band uh, very much. Um, but it could never work because of who he was. And I think Denny Lane was in there for another reason. It wasn't to sort of give Denny a bit of the spotlight. It was he just wanted someone who was a bit more his equal without actually being his equal. It was like having an adjutant for the, you know, the head of a colonel of a regiment wanted a, an efficient adjutant hmm. on a slightly lower level. That's an interesting, that's an interesting theory. I never heard anybody else say that before. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, I shouldn't have said it. <laughs> <laughs> Matter of fact, kind of bouncing off of that, uh, you discuss the partnership Briefly, uh, the the partnership with Elvis Costello, and you kind of let it kind of hang in the air that perhaps it just didn't work out. Was what do you think was at the roots of that? You know, well, why is, didn't why didn't that work? 
Well, this is the sort of unknowable side of McCartney, which is the musician, really. Um, you know, he, he, he evidently really liked um, working with Elvis Costello in that particular period because Elvis Costello had a pair of glasses that reminded him of John, you know, when John used to wear glasses and Elvis Costello was a bit sort of uh, cheeky and all of that and punky and all that. And yet he didn't release the album. <laughs> and uh, that is just the sort of amazing prerogative of being Paul McCartney. Okay. Philip, one more question. I, I mean, we've been talking about how much, how positive he is. What would you say, I mean, if, uh, I mean, to be critical of, of Paul, I mean, what's the most critical thing, the critical aspect of Paul? What What is he, I guess, what is he hard, the, you know, what is he the hardest to get along with? Um, what what he's aspect hard, of him is hardest to get along with? You mean sort of the least likable side? Yeah. Uh, I don't know, because I think, you know, the fact that a sort of a, an almost whole human being is still there is pretty amazing after all this time. Obviously, very autocratic, very controlling, always was. Okay. A lot of the trouble in the Beatles, particularly from George in the late years, of course, was because of that reason. The conviction that he can do everything, but, you know, unfortunately, he can do almost everything. There's even this sort of side of him that knows how to build flights of concrete steps, you know, and mend holes in roofs and things like that, and cook and all, of, you know, he's, um, and also all the designing of the album or the conceptualizing of the um, later Be Beatles albums and the Wings albums, you know, was, was him. <coughs> He has an amazing array of gifts and aptitudes and talents. Hmm. Okay. I just thought of one last question. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the one thing that I've noticed about Paul through the years is that with the, with the few exceptions of Ringo or um, George Martin and uh, Dave Gilmore, once Paul stops working with someone, that's it. He doesn't come back and work with anybody from his past again. And you could say that about members of Wings. You could say that about the band with uh, Hamish Stewart and Robbie McIntosh and those people. You know, I mean, it, what is it about him that once he stops working with a, with a certain artist, in most cases, it, is it just a matter of he wants to move on? I think it certainly is. He wants to move on and sort of move into another cu current sort of, you know, style. That was true of, you know, the... Um, the, the two recruits to Wings that were went to Japan in 1980 um, and they never got to tour and they were both very very good musicians of course they were and when later in, in the early 80s he's got going again maybe not as Wings but they still expected to get the call to come back to the colours and they didn't um, and that's exactly an illustration of what you said that he feels they, they've run their course and they had hardly any course to run in that in that instance well, you always heard it said the Beatles didn't like to repeat themselves. So maybe that is, Paul's kind of carrying on that tradition in his own way. Well, I think it's probably what you said, that um, you know, it, it, he's got, he's, he feels it's a new phase where he has to be different and rise to a new challenge. Hmm. Okay, well, Philip, this has been wonderful chatting with I, you here. And, I'm so uh, glad we got it together in the end. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you very much, Phil. This has been yes. really fantastic. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. much. And uh, so once much. again, the the book is called Paul McCartney: The Life. Uh, would you like us to just mention Amazon or any other place where you can purchase it? Yes, it's um, it's a pick on Amazon, or you can get it at Costco, Barnes and Noble, anywhere. I'll be coming to New York with a barrow selling copies myself in a couple of weeks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, anyway. All right. Thank you. Thanks for Thank being you, here Phil. with us. And, um, guys, you have anything you want to plug? Your own uh, contact information? Yep. Steve? They can catch me at BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. I'm uh, and also in the Beatles uh, News and Commentary Group, uh, which is growing daily, it seems. And um, we also want to say you can contact the show at Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you, and we notice, and I notice we're getting more followers every week, and so thank you for that, and, and um, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, Al, how about you? Uh, you can contact me on uh, Facebook at Al Sussman uh, or on Twitter 
at ASUSS49 or uh, through Beetle Fan Magazine, www.beetlefan.com. And Alan, how about you? Oh, probably the best way to contact me is through Facebook at Alan Cozen or my alter ego, Alan Cozen Remixed. And as for me, Ken Michaels, you can check out my website, kenmichaelsradio.com, and you can also email me directly at everylittlething at att.net. All right, once again, Philip, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Okay. Oh, you're welcome. Hey, thank you, Phil. On behalf of Steve Marinucci, Al Sussman, Alan Cozen, and Philip Norman, I'm Ken Michaels thanking all of you for listening, and we will see you next time. Next time.